The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. And welcome to the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, John Driver, filling in for Darren Jaime. And of course, you are watching the one and only interactive talk show, bringing the best of the Bronx and the world to you. First up, you'll meet one organization that is giving Bronx families one of the most important things you can find in your refrigerator. Plus, no matter how old you are, a local Bronx theater group is giving you a chance to be a celebrity. And he's hoping to take what he learned from his time in prison to teach young people how to avoid the life he once led. Also, we'll go in depth into issues affecting the Hispanic community, including controversy over the census and the growth of Dominican population in the Bronx. Finally, you're going to want to watch the latest season-long series at the New York Botanical Gardens. So, stay tuned. All this and much more is headed your way because we are now officially open. Hello Bronxites, I'm your host John Driver. Today is Wednesday, August 24, 2011. You are watching Open, the only live and interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York straight to your TV set. Feel free to give us a call at 718-960-7241 or send email to open at bronxnet.org. We invite you to write us on Twitter at Bronxnet TV. We want to hear from you. Tweet us throughout the show. Milk from the Heart is a project from social service provider Homes for the Homeless, which provides free milk to low-income families and their children throughout New York City. They've only been in existence a year, but their impact here in the Bronx is being felt. Program coordinator Jonah Nelson is here to tell us more. Welcome to the show, Jonah. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about your organization. Sure. Homes from the Homeless is one of the largest providers of transitional housing and social services within New York City. We have a number of shelters within Manhattan, the Bronx, and Queens. Uh, these are family shelters for families with children, mostly single parents. We have a summer camps program for homeless children and children who are at risk in upstate New York. And our newest program is Milk from the Heart, which distributes free 1% milk to families with children uh, in New York City. Okay, free 1% milk. Mm -hmm. Now, now who, who's eligible for this? Where does the program live in the, the sphere of New York City? Well, it's a very open program, which I'm proud to say. Anyone with children under 18 is eligible to come and get free milk with us. Uh, primarily, we're in the Manhattan and the Bronx right now, mostly Manhattan, but our program is targeted at low-income families with children. Okay, so tell me about the Bronx. You have locations in the Bronx. Where are they? Tell me about them. Sure. Uh, we have three locations in the Bronx. One is near to the studio. It's on 196th Street and Grand Concourse. We have two other sites, which are by the 183rd Street station of the 4 train. So we get all sorts of families coming to our sites, uh, mostly working families who are working one or two jobs. They're struggling. Maybe someone... Uh, in their family has lost a job, maybe it's a single mother, a lot of, lot of difficult cases. Uh, okay, so I understand this program wasn't that easy to start. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about that, uh, how this program began and some of the struggles you had initially. Sure, Homes for the Homeless had done a little bit of research on access to fresh food and healthy food and we found that mostly uh, food pantries and soup kitchens do not provide milk. And if they do, they'll provide a powdered form or a sort of a prepackaged 
shelf-stable form, such as Parmalat, which okay. isn't as good as the real thing. And often they were giving out whole milk. They wouldn't have a reduced fat 2% or 1% milk, which the American Academy of Pediatric recommends. So that's sort of where the impetus for the program started, and we wanted to see if we could do it, if we could go and distribute free milk, and if people would take it. And initially, there were people that were skeptical. I remember one family in particular in the Bronx, in one of our early locations, uh, they weren't so sure. Uh, initially, they didn't want to take the milk. They well, were used to drinking whole milk. That was the, okay. that was the problem. The okay. kids would have whole milk in their cereal and not 1% milk, so they were worried about the taste. They were worried about if the kids would like it, but they yeah, were faithful. Let's stick with that a second. Tell me about the 1%. Why, why is it important that people know that 1% milk is as good as whole milk or in some cases better. Talk a little bit about that. Well, everyone knows more or less the benefits of milk. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, most mainstream medical organizations uh, you know, really talk about the positives of milk. 1% milk is only good, I'm sorry, whole milk is only good okay. for babies and infants and past the age of two it's much better to give a child 1% milk because it has the same amount of calcium and protein, but less fat and less cholesterol. Okay, okay, stick with that. That's an important point. I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. And they believe that whole milk is actually better for kids. But in truth, and what was the age again that you said that it's really important to do that switch? Sure, after the age of two, so two. it's better to give a child 1% okay. or 2% milk or even skim as opposed okay. to whole milk because you need the fat for brain development. Okay, and why is it better not to have the fat after that age? Well, we're really looking at it at an obesity crisis uh, okay. in the country, in New York, and specifically in the Bronx. Across a number of studies, mm -hmm. the Bronx is the hardest hit for both obesity and food insecurity. So not only do people not have enough food, they're not able to get healthy food, and frequently they're overweight or obese. Okay. I think that something like a half of public school children before high school are either overweight or obese. And when these children transition into adulthood, two-thirds of them in the Bronx are overweight or obese. So we're really looking at a crisis. Okay, I want milk for my family. What do I do? You can go to our website or call us. We have a number of sites, 13 in Manhattan currently, three in the Bronx. 13 physical locations. 13 physical locations. So what we'll do is we'll partner with a social service organization mm -hmm. or a school, and we will go. Uh, we'll pick a time where families are going to be around, where families are going to be available. Uh, give me detail. Give me an example in the Bronx of a location. What times are you there? What's the location like? Sure. What do I have to do? Sure. On every Tuesday afternoon at exactly okay. 2.20, okay. our van will pull up to Middle School 206 okay. at 2280 Aqueduct Avenue by the, uh, on the corner of 183rd Street. So that's right by the Ford train. It's about two avenues away. We'll pull up exactly at 2.20 okay. every Tuesday, and there will be a line waiting for us. So all you have to do is show up. We ask you the number of children you have in your house, or the number of adults in the apartment, and you're able to get milk. Do, I don't have to register There's online. no registry. I just show up. You can just show up. Once you know the time and the location, you just need to show up in time for the distribution. And because there's such a high demand, we do request that people come at the listed distribution <laughs> time or they risk not getting milk. Okay, what's your plan for the Bronx? You, you mentioned to me earlier that you were thinking about expanding in the Bronx. What would you like to do there? Well, as I said, we have three sites in the Bronx as of now. We would like to expand to between 12 and 14 locations within the Bronx so we're able to give out more milk, we're able to reach more families, we're able to disseminate more nutrition information, we're hoping to expand our nutrition education component so that we have a, a cooking element where we're able to show people how to make healthy food, and how to make it taste good because there's a trio for healthy food that's often overlooked. It needs to be cheap, it needs to be accessible, and it needs to taste good. But if you don't know how to cook, you're most certainly not going to be able to get the element of taste. Okay. All right. If right. Let's say I, I want milk. Who funds this? I mean, that's a question I have. Where does the, where does the money come from? from for this milk? Initially, we were very lucky to have a grant from the Stern Family Foundation, 
and they were able to start the program. Okay. So the associated cost with milk and having a van to go around and distribute the milk. But, but as you look to the future, where's where's the funding coming from? What what are your needs in that respect? We've gotten a lot of small donations, so we're looking to keep it up. Okay. We're really looking for small donors to step up to the plate because about five dollars can give three families milk. So it doesn't take a lot to make a very big difference in people's lives. Okay. Okay, we, you, we've got just a few seconds left. What would you like people to do? What, would you, what do you need them to do? What's your call to action? Our call to action is for people uh, to continue doing what they've been doing and trying to eat healthy in the face of adversity. I'll, I'll give a quick anecdote. Okay. There's a man who comes with his family to one of our distributions in the Bronx, and on the side, he sells empanadas. And I think this is sort of the epitome of the problem, is that he's stuck in a cycle of obesity. The community wants a specific type of food and they're not able to request something else. Um, so I think that, that this is one of our, our major, major problems. People need to step up to the plate and to say, we want more grocery stores. We want more produce in bodegas. We want more produce in grocery stores that we already have. And that's sort of the thing that we need people to do. We'll keep supplying the milk and the support and the nutrition education and they need to step up and engage their own community to say, we want healthy food, we can do this. Okay, there we have it. After the break, we will be joined by a member of the local theater group that is giving back to the community, so stay right here. Thank you, Jim. Hello there, we're back here on Open. At some time in our life, we all want to experience fame, whether it be local or worldwide. And the folks at Local Celebrity Theater want to do just that. They're giving everyone a chance to shine. Participants work with actors to hone their skills, and what sets this organization apart is their work with several national charities. Here to tell us more is founder, Chris Manitakis. Hello. Welcome to Open. Thank you very much. So, tell <coughs> me about your organization. Well, Local Celebrity Theater is a nonprofit uh, company that we had started. Um, 
I've always been involved in theater, like since I was a kid, and I performed in high school. And dangerous thing performing in high school. I did it myself. <laughs> Changed my life. I'll it tell you it that. really does. It's, you know, it's a. <clears throat> excuse me. It really is a place where people get to find themselves and grow, and and you make a lot of friends and. For me, it was something that was always a very big deal in high school. You know, we did all the shows, and then you graduate, and it comes to an end. And it's something that you love to do so much. And then, and then what? You know, either you could try to make it on a professional level, or there really is not many opportunities for you to continue, you know, doing something that you love. So, from when I was about 17, which is years ago. Um, you know, I wanted to start some type of an organization that you know would let us perform, but we didn't really have the resources, and I didn't really have the connections to make it happen. Um, you know, and I, I felt it'd be a little selfish just to start a group for the sake of I want to perform. You know, okay. like that really. Okay. It, I just thought it was selfish, so uh, I came up with this idea. I, I just feel like the, we're in a very negative time. There's a lot of negativity out there, and there needs to be more positive things for people to do. Um, and I feel like you know, helping other people is kind of a lost art right okay. now. You know, so I, I thought coupling a, a theater group, which you know, we get cast of like 50 or so people for some of our shows, Big coupling cats. that along with you know, some type of charity would encourage those people to get involved in some charity work and maybe, you know, branch out from there, maybe get their family involved or their friends, you know, to do more positive things. So that's where the, the idea came from for this group. Okay, so I want to join your company here. What do I do? Wait, I want to be a star. <coughs> okay. Make me a star. Come Make on. you a star. I want to be a star. Well, you could go what do on I do? You want me to, to sing, uh, dance? Do I have to act? What do I have to do? You could do a bit right here if you like. <laughs> you could audition right now. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get back to that later. I like that <laughs> idea a lot. Okay. We have, um, we have open auditions for all of our performances. We really encourage anyone to come out, different age groups. It doesn't matter your level of experience. Um, our motto is entertain, educate, and inspire. Um, and that's what we do. You know, we put on shows, we entertain people, but we approach it from an educational standpoint. We like to work with people and teach people really the basics of theater. We don't just throw you on stage and, you know, you do whatever you want. You know, we try to work with you and, you know, hone your skills and all that. And then the inspire part comes, you know, we try to inspire people to do positive things in the community. Okay, so I want to be a star. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what everybody's thinking. I yep. know, I want to cut right to the chase here. So when's the next time I can show up to be a star and what do I have to do? Do I go, do you... Where do you post the call? Mm -hmm. What do I have to show up? Do I have to have a song? Do I bring my companies? <laughs> you know, well, my, my boom box with my, you know. Yeah, we post our audition notices normally on our website, okay. which is uh, localcelebritytheater.com. Okay. Uh, we're also on Facebook, so you can find us there. Just search Local Celebrity Theater, we'll pop up. Um, that's where we post most of our audition notices. And we will have auditions coming up in September. I don't have an exact date okay. yet, but you could check back. That's for our next show. But normally we'll tell you, you know, if we're doing a musical, you have to just, you know, perform part of a song. Um, sometimes we do, you know, dramas or comedies, and we'll have sides provided, like people could read, you know, okay. scenes and all that type of thing. So that's pretty much what we do, you okay. know, for auditions. So if I want, if I have to sing something, what is your next show a musical, or you don't Our know yet? Our next show will be musical. Okay, yeah. you know, tell me about the next show. What's the next show? Um, the next show actually is a, a throwback to the old uh, like Rat Pack oh, okay, sort of sure. era. So sure. right. it's uh, the Johnny Valentino variety show. Okay. And uh, it's an original show. It's an original totally. show. Okay. It's an right. original show. We do original stuff sometimes. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. But it's it's you know old. Um, standard songs and some musical theater songs and comedy sketches, original comedy sketches and, and stuff like that. So it really should be a lot of fun. And that's going to be probably a, a teen through, you know, as old as, as possible kind of show. And how big's the cast? Uh, the cast for that, I would like ideally between 60 to 70 people. 60 to a Broadway cast yeah. is 25 people. Yeah. You have 60 to 70 60 to people. 70. So there, obviously there's a great opportunity for anyone to get mm -hmm. on stage here. Yeah, I, I really, I don't like turning people away. <laughs> I guess not. Oh, I really I like don't. That. I That's think, terrific. you know, everybody I think really deserves That's the opportunity wonderful. and I try very hard. You know, people are at different levels and what I do as, as president and most of the time I direct the shows, 
you just try to showcase everybody, you know, show their strengths. You know, like if you're okay. not a strong singer, I won't have you get up there and sing. We'll figure out something else that you could do to get you some, you know, shine time. So I really work very hard okay. with every single member of the cast to give them some time. So do you cast and then create the show? This one is a little tricky. It's a little of both. Okay, okay. We have, um, I'm actually going to be in it, um, and we have some people who've performed with us before who we know definitely are going to be a part of it. Okay, so what are you playing? What's your role? Um... Uh, What's your role? I don't want to spoil it. Okay, it's a, okay. It's a, I, I don't want to spoil it. But, oh, but I, uh, I want to audition. Do I show up with Sinatra? What do I come in? Yeah, with? absolutely. You could okay. show up and just do, sing an old standard song or a, some type of musical theater song. Okay. And that's it. And we go from there. And if I don't sing, I if show up anyway. If you don't sing, we are also going to be doing like comedy skits and things okay. like that. So you could prepare like a short comedy monologue. Okay. Just so we get your comedic timing down and see what you could do from an acting standpoint. Okay. You know what the secret of of comedy is? A ask me what the secret what of comedy is. What is the secret? Timing. Of there you go. That's an old joke. It's, it's an old Burl joke. <laughs> Actually, I came out of theater myself, so I was one of the first male understudy in Greece on mm -hmm. Broadway. Did two years on Broadway, so I know it, and it was my life, and still is to a certain extent. So I love it. It's a great passion, and it's it's really what's really mm -hmm. wonderful here is that you are giving anybody a chance to be on stage yep. and your generosity is very unusual and I know this business mm -hmm. of the theater very very well yeah. and it's interesting that you make have that approach because mm -hmm. a lot of places don't they're very very limiting and they in a community theater a normal community theater situation there's a script and there's X number of people and there's X number of roles mm -hmm. and that cast size is finite yeah and you're actually saying to anybody hey come on, we're yep. going to get you on stage. Now, at some point, maybe you're going to have 150 people, and you're not going to have a stage big enough. Yeah. So hopefully you're going to have that problem down the line. Yeah. We want to get to a point. Um, we just started um, June of 2010 was our first performance. We've only been around a little over a year. Sure. Let's show some pictures here. While okay. you're, uh, go ahead. While, keep talking. Yeah, so while we've you're... been around a little over a year. We've already done over 10 performances, Okay. which is pretty crazy. Tell me some of the shows, um, some of the things you've done. We've done, uh, our, yeah, some we've done an, a cabaret there. performance. We've okay. done a show, Dog Sees God, Confessions of a Teenage Blockhead by Burton Royal, which is a okay. great show that deals with bullying and stuff okay. like that. Oh, I love that. That's um, great. We've done a... A Broadway review last year. Okay. Uh, during the holidays, we actually did an original production called Telethon for Santa, which I <laughs> co-wrote with a friend of it. mine, and it was uh, sort of basically like you know times are tough. Tell us what we're looking at right here. Um, tell right us what now, we're this is myself uh, in the middle there with a the broom. This is us doing a number from Curtains, Show People. Okay. Um, that was in our Broadway review last year. Okay. Okay. Keep yeah. Keep, roll some more pictures if you've got them, and we'll yeah. Tell um, us this about is the, this. this is maybe one third of the cast for Telethon for Santa. We had about seventy cast. people in that show. <laughs> it was insane. Everybody uh, looks like they're fun. having a lot of. It fun. It was such a great time. It really was, and you know, to have everybody together during the holidays, a lot of old friends and you know, people brought sure. you know family members to be a part of the cast. So it was really cool to have everybody all together for that. Um, okay. I don't know if we have anything else. You got any more, sh any more shots there that we can talk nope, about? No, that's us. We're back. Okay, so uh, this sounds like a, a phenomenal opportunity. You have, uh, you have a production coming up. We have very a production coming here. up. Would you yes. like to talk a little bit about yes. that? And it I know is, that's imminent. It is this weekend. Okay. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The Friday and Saturday shows are at 8 p.m., the Sunday shows a matinee at 3 p.m. It's going to be at Lehman High School, which is at 3000 East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx, right over the Hutch. Um, this show is called Could Have Been Broadway. It is, it's a review, it's a musical review, but what we did, instead of doing a tradition, could have, could been, have Broadway. been Broadway. Okay. So instead of traditional Broadway songs, we took songs that you might know from film, okay. or we took, you know, pop songs or sure. rock songs going back from the 50s up until present day and we pretty much dramatize them on stage. It's almost like real life music videos, um, but it's a re really cool thing that we, we have going on. There's uh, 18 numbers in the show, Okay. so it's a lot of fun. Well, it sounds great, it's wonderful, and you know, Chris, it sounds terrific. I think you're doing a great thing out there. It sounds like a lot of fun for a lot of people. Stay right here, because there's more open right after this.
And so the king ordered his men into battle. And even though he was no longer acting in the best interest, they followed obediently. But what if they didn't? What if they just refused? What if selfish leaders got no support? What if people had the courage to stand up when something wasn't right? What if the government didn't just serve a lucky few? What if it was designed and run for all the people, no matter what race, color, or creed? What if we didn't put up with anything less? What if? These are your human rights. There are 30 of them. They belong to you. You don't have to buy them, or apply for them, or ask permission to have them. They're just yours. No matter who you are, where you're from, how old you are, or anything else. It's just that simple. Now some people may try to ignore your rights, or violate them, or pretend they don't exist. But they can't change the fact that they're yours. Human right number 30. No one can take away your human rights. What are human rights? Find out at youthforhumanrights.org. Okay, now you ready? Now, just like I showed you. Yeah. Now push in the clutch yeah. and gently yeah. shift it in the first I, gear. I remember. Okay. okay. That was good. Oh, honey, look this way. Look this way. Oh. Honey, get the gas on the one. Get the gas. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. I didn't put your hands on the wheel. Hey, honey, it's okay. You're doing great. You're driving. Hey, why don't you just pull over right here? That's perfect. Break, 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 break. Thank you, Dad. Hello viewers, remember this is a live and interactive talk show, so join in on the conversation by calling 718-960-7241 or just send an email to open at bronxnet.org. When our next guest was 17, he was sent to prison for killing another teen during a fight. He spent 16 years in prison. During this time, he turned his life around by taking part in several programs, and today, he is a youth counselor at the Fortune Society, an organization that helps former incarcerated men and women re-enter society. Mr. Roberto Rodriguez, welcome to the show. Pleasure of having me. Thank you. So you've gone through a lot of tough things in your life already, haven't you? Yes, unfortunately. Okay. But you seem to have moved beyond that, and you're with an organization right now that's doing some from what I understand, wonderful things. Absolutely. Would you like to talk a bit about that organization? Absolutely. Um, Fortune Society is a nonprofit org who caters to um, the formerly incarcerated and individuals who may have any infraction with the law of felony level offense. And rather than then having to be sent to prison, they will be mandated to attend prevention programs at Fortune Society that will eventually give them skills and tools that they may need in order to maintain a free, uh, crime-free life. Okay, so, so this is an alternative. Uh, right, I, turn to incarceration. Let's agency. say I had committed a crime. I right. might have an opportunity to work with your organization instead of being incarcerated, instead of spending time in prison. Right, not so much work 
as well. There are internships, but it's more or less having to um, get into a program that more or less is catered towards the offense. For example, you may um, have been arrested for um, a crime of substance abuse, or you may have been um, had anger issues. So Fortune Society offers a various of programs that will address issues sort of that nature. Okay, give me a specific example For, and with a specific mm -hmm. crime and and do you have a can you give us a, without mentioning names a, right. an example of someone who's worked with your program? Well, you have uh, the uh, part of the the wellness program is an enhancement program. Okay. That's um in conjunction with the substance abuse treatment and the Better Living Center, which is a licensed mental health clinic at Fortune. And what I do as a wellness navigator and case manager is that the clients that I serve are more or less are either youth or an adult or female or male gender. And for in my, in my instances, they have individuals who may have already um, had an experience, like you know, preventing, trying to prevent having to FaceTime. So more or less, when I engage them, I sort of like speak to them and sort of encourage them not to choose that path because there's nothing that's, you know, there's a lot at stake for them. Okay, let, let, let me, I want to try to work through this clearly. Right. I'm, say my name is Joe mm -hmm. and I commit a crime. Give right. me the crime that I committed. Tell well, me that. Well, it could crime? range from, pick from one, a, pick a, 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 a specific. Pos um, possession of um, paraphernalia. Okay, suppose I have possession of drug. Right. Paraphernalia. I'm convicted of that crime. Right. Okay. The judge says, "You work with this organization, Joe. I go to you. Okay. Tell me. Tell me what happens right. when I go to what, you. What do you do? In what many do instances, do my, that's not my role. Okay. Um, Fortune Society has court advocates. Okay. Um, staff that station in each five boroughs, and what they do is, as the the judge is reading out the cases to the um, to the uh, um, defendants. Okay. The court advocate will impose and recommend that the, the client, rather than having to face time, he'll be referred to Fortune okay. to attend prevention programs. So I attend your program. Right. What, what happens at the program? Well, at the program, they are um, mandated to um, attend at least 20 hours okay. of any type of prevention program. It's five days a week. Okay. And it could be up from six months to up to a year depending on the participants' progress. Okay. So if they comply, they'll more than likely avoid having to be sent to prison. Okay, if I don't show up, what happens? Right, well, you have to, it'll be reported to the, to the court. Okay. The judge will be notified immediately, and, and he I'm, will more than likely will be remanded. Sure, okay. So how do you judge my progress? I'm Joe, I was convicted of this. I am in your program. How do you determine that I am making progress. What are the, what's your evaluation procedure? Well, it's a team effort. Um, like, in, for instance, in my case, in my position, I work in conjunction with the primary counselor, okay. which is the, um, the substance abuse counselor. And more or less what we do is we, we, um, we try to address the needs that the client may come in with. For example, a lot of men and women who are re-entering society, a lot of them are not... Um, <clears throat> they may not have a primary care physician, a psychiatrist. They may not have no source of income. So my role as a wellness navigator and case manager is to address issues as that by trying to um, link them. It's a linkage of care. So okay. what I do is I have the resources at my fingertips. I sign me with them, and we tailor out what's the most immediate needs that they may have in order to be successful, and we address those needs accordingly. So this is a wonderful program for the right person, obviously. It's a great alternative. Right. And quickly, who are the kinds of people that should you take advantage of the services of Fortune? Well, I would say anyone who's trying to better themselves, okay. anyone who's trying to prevent having to choose that, that life of crime, if they really want to um, you know, become equipped with the skills and tools that they may need, I, was, I would recommend Fortune Society because okay. Fortune Society embraces each client as they come in. And I would like to paraphrase um, our president of Fortune Society, Ms. Joanne Page, how she often states, um, 
treat each individual that walks in through Fortune's door like if they were one of a family member that was coming in to seek services. And that's sort of the mindset that we have collectively. Okay. Great. We have about two minutes left. We, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned that you had some things personally, based on your experience, right. that you would like to share with the youth of the Bronx and others in the Bronx. And I thought Absolutely. this could be a, a good time to do that. Well, um, my advice to the youth in the community is, you know, take heed to um, the advice that your parents and loved ones and those significant others are in your life. Take heed to what they, the advice that they give you. Um, do not choose your friends over your family because at the end of the day, your family is the ones that's going to st stick through you. Um, it's, it's, it's a lose-lose situation when, when you choose the life crime where you... And, choose to get involved with gangs, activities, and things of that nature, because there's nothing good that's coming out of it. So Why I would say is it lose-lose? Why is it lose-lose? Because, you know, you, you devastate not only the community, you devastate the lives of others. You're destroying your family. You're destroying, um, you know, a, a victim who, who maybe just may have been walking by because you choose to have the mentality, you know, that you have from having to be living that lifestyle you victimize someone who perhaps was on their way to going to work or paying the rent. Okay. Well, thank you very much. After the break, the founder of the Community Empowerment Network will explain how his organization is working with the Dominican American National Roundtable. Coming home can be hard if you're a veteran of Iraq or Afghanistan. You may feel like you're all alone. But you're not alone. At IAVA.org, your fellow vets are all around you. Join our free online community, get the resources you need, and connect to other vets who know where you're coming from. IAVA.org, we've got your back. Can you tell which of these children was not born free? Can you tell which of these children was not born equal? Can you tell which of these children does not deserve to be treated with dignity? We can't either. Human right number one, we are all born free and equal. What are human rights? Find out at youthforhumanrights.org. out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. We're back and you're watching Open. The Community Empowerment Network's sole purpose is to provide a safe haven for low-income underserved adolescents, to keep them off the streets and away from gang violence and drug activities. Founder Miguel Santana is here to tell us about the organization its collaboration with the Dominican American National Roundtable and issues affecting the Bronx. Miguel, welcome to the show. 
Thank you. Thank you. How long have you been involved with this organization? With the Community Empowerment Network, mm -hmm. it's uh, been um, in existence since 2006, and basically we focus on you know, providing services to youth as it relates to education, recreation, and intervention, and we try to keep them off drugs, off the streets, and out of gangs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you're involved with issues right now that it's, they're, it's a very hot topic right now. Right. Redistricting. Correct. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Yes. Um, um, every, every 10 years or so, after the census has taken place or has been um, enacted, uh, what happens is there's a redistricting process. In essence, that's a way of carving out districts that impact communities as well as, as elected officials who reside over them. And usually what impacts them is the fact that the population may be changing. It may be um, you know, different ethnicities emerging in different communities. And as a result of that, folks that have a vested interest may want to, I guess, modify the district to reflect or have a representative that reflects those individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you perceive the current redistricting right now as not being fair or it should be changed? What do you Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question that you ask because uh, there are people out there that feel that it should be handled by an independent party mm -hmm. to address mm -hmm. the, the redistricting process. In the past, in elected officials were very active in that process, but right now... How strange. Yes, right. <laughs> but now you have uh, Governor Cuomo who's flirting with the idea of having an independent commission being at the key or at the forefront of that redistricting process. Now, is this possible? Is it possible to do this, do you think? And what needs to happen for that uh, to become a fact? Well, I think uh, what's happening is discussions are being held at the state level, of course, uh, Governor Cuomo would like to see this thing uh, work itself out, but if he has to, I guess, impose his will, then he will push for this independent commission or independent body to be the folks that address that process. Okay, and you want this independent commission? I think so. I think okay. it's, 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 it's ideal for communities that feel that perhaps they don't have a voice in the process. Um, uh, usually a voice in, in, in the process in past years is advocating, speaking about it, and so forth and so on. However, as it relates to this independent commission, it's, it's taking the process out of the hands of those who may have a more, I guess, active process in the past and, and, and keeping them at bay and letting an independent commission come in and doing it in a way that's be, that'll be more fair. Okay, to fairly represent the Dominican community, right. what would you like to see happen in terms well, of redistricting? I ideally, we would like to see a representative that, that is of Dominican descent represent a district that reflects uh, the population. And does the current redistricting prevent that? from happening, do you think? The process, I don't think, will prevent it because, of okay. course, in September, there will be hearings throughout the five boroughs um, as it relates to this redistricting process. So we'll have different advocacy groups out there, one in particular, the Dominican American National Roundtable, going out there and making a case why we feel that we need a candidate or an elected official that is of Dominican descent that's going to represent the Dominican community. Now, is the Dominican community in a particular geographical area right now? Yes. And where is that, and should it be redistricted? Well, it's interesting it, that you say that because um, the thought out there is that most Dominicans are in upper Manhattan. But as time has moved forward, folks from Manhattan are migrating into the Bronx. So now the Bronx, based on the last census, the most current census, has the most Dominicans, not only in the city, but nationwide. Okay, do you have any statistics and percentage? I mean, what percentage of the population? It, it's been of the estimated Bronx? that okay. there, there would be roughly about a quarter of a million uh, okay. Dominicans coming into the Bronx, That's... if not already here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a particular geographical area, one place within the Bronx where there is a group? Yes. That essentially, and wh where is that area? What yeah. is that? That part uh, of the Bronx? I would say where where you have the most concentrated amount of Dominicans in the Bronx would be in the High Bridge area. Of okay. course, this sprinkles of us throughout the Bronx, but specifically over the High Bridge area. And the reason for that is because 
uh, Upper Manhattan is not too far away. You can cross the 181st Street Bridge and come into the Bronx or 207, uh, 207 you know, in Fordham Row mm -hmm. and Marble Hill area. So you have High Bridge and a little bit north of that, which becomes Kings Bridge, is where you have a very concentrated amount of Dominicans. Now, does the current redistricting allow for a representative from that area, mm -hmm. basically, now? I mean, what's the current situation on the redistricting well, for, it, the, based on where your Dominican population is? Well, that's where it all comes into play. Right now, the, there's a series of maps that are being right. presented to individuals to assess, well, you know, what's the best way to have representation? So there's a current map yes. and proposed maps. Correct. Okay. Correct. How does the current map look to you? Well, the current map right now is really focused exclusively in Manhattan. Okay. And what happens is you do still have Dominicans in Manhattan, but when you're talking about redistricting, it doesn't necessarily exclude the Bronx. Okay. So they, they'll, they'll spill over into the Bronx. So it's a question of, okay, where is the population at and how can we have representation? And are there two opposing new maps or new maps that, that come from different groups? Well, I'm not aware of other groups that okay. are doing it as, okay. as it relates to the Dominican interest, but the Dominican American National Roundtable has actually three maps, you know, three okay. different alternatives as to how a, a map or a district could be created that reflects a Dominican, you know, elected official. And currently, who makes the final decision? Oh, well, that, that would, you know, fall on the governor and, and, of course, whatever commission may come from that particular body. So you think there will be an independent commission or you don't know or you're hoping or what, what do you, where, where does it stand right now? Personally, ideally, I think it, it's in a good thing to have an independent commission. Okay. That's my personal opinion. Okay. And that's what you would like. All right. Yes. Now, how does this relate to your, your program as a whole? Okay. okay. This is one element of that. Right. But let's get a bit back to that and your organization and its goals. Let's mm -hmm. talk well, in yeah. terms of Community Empowerment Network, our focus has been to cater to the youth. And one of the things that are, that's going to be happening in October, as a matter of fact, October 7th through the 9th, mm -hmm. is there's going to be a, conf a conference here at Lehman College. As a result of that, there's going to be a component that's geared or focused for the youth specifically. Now, that's an ideal scenario where Community Empowerment Network could partner up with the Dominican American National Roundtable and really put an event together that addresses the youth, or at least provide a platform for the youth to express themselves. So that's something that we're truly, you know, excited about. You know, we're looking forward to really seeing how that evolves. Right now, we're meeting with youth. As a matter of fact, today, I'll be meeting with some of these student youth, which represent Lehman, BCC, Hostess Community College, College, and others. And we're trying to engage them in that process to, to create an event that reflects their interest, that will resonate among their youth, you know, their age category, and we're serving as a facilitator in that process. Okay, so when will people know about this and when will the information about it be out there? Well, the information is out there on Facebook right now. Okay. If folks search 2001 Dominican American National Roundtable Youth Showcase, they will be able to find the page. Um, if they go to the website, danr.org, they will be able to find this information. So it's out there right now. Of course, we're still promoting it. We're still about a month away from the event, so word of mouth is very effective. Of course, the students themselves are reaching out to their, their student bodies, their student government associations, and that's the way that we're getting the word out. How can people get involved in this process right now to shape that event? Well, we're meeting every Wednesday pretty much at the at Lehman Cafeteria around 5, 5.30, a group of us with students, and we're encouraging even musicians to come by, talk with us, because they're the ones that are going to be the ones performing, they're the ones that are going to be doing all the activities that are going to draw all the youth. So basically they can reach out to me if they like to, it's 347-275-1339, and of course they can come and meet with us. And the event itself, give me just a, a few seconds of what the event will be like. 
the event specifically to the youth or the overall conference? The overall, the, well, the, the, the event as it happens, that whatever that event will be. Well, basically, you're going to have youth coming out there performing, singing, dancing, uh, playing instruments. You have different groups that are musicians, and they're going to perform. And they're going to do comedy. They're going to do spoken word. Okay. These are all their ideas. This is something that is relevant to them. Okay. All right. Open is going out into the open to give you a look at the New York Botanical Garden's latest season-long series. gonna go to college what are you saying you've got to go to college well they offered me a job and son college is much more important no yes no mom yes anyways it's my decision okay well then decide what degree you're going to get because you will go to college their tomorrow depends on your words today the Hispanic scholarship fund has the information you need to help your kids go to college flashlight and the batteries? Yes. Did you make sure we're not missing anything in the first aid kit? Yep. Did you go through the plan with the kids again? Yes. The more you prepare today, the more you'll be able to reduce the devastating effects of a tornado, an earthquake, a power outage, or any other disaster. Hello and welcome back to Open. The New York Botanical Garden presents Edible Garden Cooking, a new series of garden to table cooking demonstrations. And this package has a name you're gonna love. Sweet and Stinky is part of the Edible Gardens cooking series at the New York Botanical Gardens, which combines gardening, cooking, and a healthy lifestyle into an interactive experience. We've got time to run out. This is the only like two a... acres of, of our entire campus in which the visitors are invited to uh, help take care of the garden. So we invite uh, families, our school children, uh, to dig in the garden and plant and transplant, look for weeds and harvest. With record-breaking temperatures, there's no question that summer is here. As an alternative summer activity, the Botanical Gardens offers daily demonstrations in the Ruth Bree Howell Family Garden, offering kids and families an opportunity to create meals with vegetables and herbs grown at the organic family garden. We, uh, we have a big garden, we have a big staff, and, and, so we, and we've been doing it a long time, so we try new, new plants. Um, and so we like you know we're growing basil. We have about you know 15 different kinds of basil out here. We have uh, an opal basil, a purple ruffles. We have uh, cinnamon basil. There's an African blue basil, and but we also have the Genovese basil. We have uh, this year we also have like a finissimo, which is a really small leaf basil in our uh, babo garden. Uh, and then we have most rosa, which is a great big basil. So it's, you know those kind of things you'll come across with just different varieties that you wouldn't tend to see in, in a supermarket. And because this month we're celebrating celebrating sweet and stinky aromatic herbs and culinary alliums, we're visiting the onion patch to pick a couple different kinds actually to make caramelized onions and teach people about some kitchen chemistry. Each month, the garden offers a different activity, and during the month of July, children and parents alike have an opportunity to pick fresh ingredients to make and sample the garden's besto pesto and sweet caramelized onions. So we've collected our basil, our onions, and our garlic, and now we head back to the demo kitchen to put it all together for some tasty pesto. So who here has used a food processor before? 
me. Cool, you've used one, yeah, good. They'd rather you not use the stove or the oven because it's hot. But what's I nice know. about a food processor and With food processor with kids, is that everything dangerous is on the inside, so you're good to go. Who's ever had caramel candy or caramel apples? What color is the caramel? Brown. 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 Yeah, that's brown. So After what... harvesting and sampling the delicious offerings of the garden, the sweet and stinky scavenger search began. We caught up with Connell, who let us know what he learned about basil, the main ingredient in the besto pesto. Well, what about the basil? What did you learn about basil today? Uh, that it comes in different colors. It comes in different colors, and what's different about basil? Is it square or round, the stalk? Square. During the month of August, visitors to the garden will have an opportunity to sample pickle recipes from Korea, Ireland, Italy, China, and the Caribbean, and an opportunity to pickle vegetables from the five global gardens. The Edible Garden Series will end the weekend of September 24th and 25th in preparation for the appearance and cooking demonstration by Chef Mario Batelli, The garden is growing key ingredients used in most of his recipes. Because in September, Mario Batelli is going to join us for cooking demonstrations. And we um, have here the Batali uh, Beets, Beans, Garlic and Greens Garden which grows a lot of the ingredients he cooks with. Today's cooking event at the Family Gardens is part of a larger series called Sweet and Stinky, being put on by the New York Botanical Gardens. For more information, please visit nybg.org. For BronxNet, this is Sylvia Anglin. It's been a pleasure coming into your homes. We'd like to thank our guests for joining us, and especially you, our viewers, for tuning in. You can watch us again tonight on the Recable cast at 10 p.m. on Channel 67. Of course, you can catch a new episode on Friday at 10 a.m. with our Valentine, Rena Valentine. Have an amazing week. Look at the world with your imagination. Embrace diversity. And don't forget to keep your heart and mind open. You're really not that talented. You're not attractive. Too fat. You're too short. Too old. Why don't you just give up? Give up. Give up. Just give up.